Well, I'm going to welcome our guest tonight, guys. Students, you are so you're you're in, in a huge treat uh, today to listen to Blaine Strickland. Uh, as Blaine I mentioned a few moments ago, he is a CCIM instructor. By now, you guys all know what CCIM stands for. Uh, there's much to continue to learn, but those who want to get into commercial real estate, there's no per, no better uh, institution to continue to learn, be a lifelong learner. We always talk about that, but also it's just the incredible network and this relationship that Blaine and I have, that, that we have, uh, ties back to CCIM as one that's going to continue to grow throughout uh, uh, as we look moving forward. I am thrilled to share a little bit about Blaine's background and he also went to a real estate program. I don't have that against him, but just kind of take this in real quick, if you don't, if you don't mind, guys. And I kind of looked around for a great intro, and I'm like, here I am reading his book. Guys, you see the book right here? And I was like, well, I went to the back panel, and there it was, just something perfect. And so just kind of take this in, uh, troops. Uh, Blaine Strickland is a lifetime veteran of the commercial real estate industry. Guys, 40 years. I've got, I've got about 20. So he's, 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 he's lapped me many times over. Uh, after, under, after earning an undergraduate and graduate degrees in real estate from the University of Florida, Lane launched a career that has spanned 40 years so far. He has played many roles along the way, including broker, manager, owner, investor, professor, syndicator, and developer. He became a CCIM designate in 19. 87 and he is a senior instructor for the institute right now and that started that kicked off in 2008. Uh, Blaine's got a, several publications this is the second of this particular series. Blaine's first book was entitled Thrive 10 prescriptions for exceptional performance as a commercial real estate agent. It became a bestseller in 2018. The book, was, the book has been widely acclaimed for its guidance on how to accelerate performance, build an, an effective team, and employ effective management tactics. You can find different versions, hardcover, Kindle, the audio book format. You guys who like to run or walk and podcast, it's all there. The audio book is there on Amazon. And he's going to touch upon his, his, his nuggets as far as how best he can advise you about your career moving forward and he'll also shed some light throughout his presentation on his new book it's uh called adapt and you're looking at it uh, it's a very very quick read and blaine thank you again i'm looking forward to your sharing with our students and then having a robust q a at the very end and by the way students you as you're listening if you have a question you do not have to wait to the very end. You can write it in the Q&A. At the very end, Cherie will come back in, or I will, and we will try to cover those Q&A questions at that particular time. Blaine, the show is yours, buddy. Thank you again. Thank you, Grayson. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me just, before I let you go, is my screen showing? Yes, on my end. Okay, so I'm working on the theory that the students can see the slides here that, here I'll back up one. Uh, so uh, good evening students, thank you for inviting me to be with you tonight. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a elderly, elderly uh, member of your, a senior member of your fraternity. Um, Forty years ago I sat where you sat. I transferred to the University of Florida as a junior because I wanted to go into commercial real estate and back in the caveman days it was one of the few schools that had a program and so um, way back then I, I transferred to Florida there were six real estate professors um, I stayed an extra year and a half wrote a thesis because that's how we got a master's degree in those days and then um, the rest is history I became an appraiser then I worked with CBRE for 10 years and then I spent 20 years in the development business and really uh, working on projects of all sizes, uh, started my own firm, and then really over the last 10 years have been uh, focused on being a coach and an advisor to top performing brokers and teams. Um, <clears throat> and I thought what I would try to do today is give you 
um, some nuggets, if you will, Grayson called them nuggets, insights into these three questions. I know you're all thinking about trying to get through this week and get through the um, exams, but <clears throat> I thought it might be interesting for me just to pass on some ideas that I have for you in terms of being as attractive as possible as you enter the job market. Um, the second idea here just comes from the many, many times that I interact with young people and I say, well, what is your goal? And they many times say, I want to become a developer. And um, that's great. I was a developer for many, many years. Um, I think I could give you some ideas about starting to put action steps to that. You you will, it's very unlikely that you will come right out of school and become a developer. It's possible, but very unlikely. You have to build your path there, and I can give you some ideas about how to make that path pay off. And then finally, for those of you who care about the brokerage side of the, of the industry, um, I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, Grayson uh, mentioned the new book. It's called Adapt. Disruption is coming to commercial real estate brokerage. Are you ready? And so I would just try to use some thoughts out of that book to give you a, some, a little bit of sense of sort of where we're headed. So uh, I'm going to jump in. I think you guys have... Uh, the PDF, or you can get the PDF. You're certainly welcome to take notes. I've got one eyeball on the slides and one eye eyeball on the uh, on the uh, chat box, so we can do that. And of course, Grayson will be uh, monitoring. Grayson and Sheree will monitor that as well. Okay, so off we go. Um, five things you can do now to become more attractive as a potential employee. And the note that I've made here is become more active in trade associations, trade organizations. Hopefully you're already uh, active. And what I want you to think about is becoming even more active. Um, all of these trade organizations, ULI, ICSC, BOMA, NAOP, um, CRU, they all have these next gen um, scenarios where they uh, invite you to their lunches at a very low cost. They have case study competitions. They have field trips. They have meet the mentor. Um, CCIM has a mentoring program. So there are lots of opportunities. Or to say it differently, the industry is trying to embrace you. So if you will raise your hand and be visible, you will be seen. There's lots of scholarships. Um, my son became a CCIM two years ago. And uh, he joined the chapter and worked on the golf tournament and, and worked on the Christmas party. And that showed as a new member that he was interested. And so he was awarded scholarships. I think he uh, took three out of his four CCIM courses at a reduced rate. So that's an opportunity for you. Um, <clears throat> if you're isolated, then of course now there's lots of webinars. Uh, you might have heard uh, Grayson and I talking about one that I'm going to be doing in two days where I was invited by RealNex, which is a, 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 a CRM for the commercial real estate uh, industry, has invited me to uh, interact with their leader. You'll learn about what I have to say, but also, also you'll learn about, um, about RealNex and their products and what they bring to the industry. Um, if there's any way that you can listen in on those or sign up for them and then get the archive and listen to that, it can be very, very valuable. There's lots of people trying to produce content right now. Um, you can, if you scroll through LinkedIn, you'll see opportunities to be part of calls. Um, so hopefully you'll have an opportunity to get involved that way. Many of these uh, organizations produce very valuable publications. CCIM does a great job of that. Uh, a lot of these organizations have newsletters or, uh, you know, monthly minutes, those kind of things. A lot of them have job boards. Um, a lot of times you'll see that the employers, <clears throat> the potential employers will post, hey, we're looking for somebody. And uh, it's a great opportunity to just be uh, tuned in. There's, this is an industry that really seeks to bring you in. It is the opposite of a closed society, and it's a very open society. And so um, we have tried to make it as uh, easy as possible for you to come in. So if you, if you work at it, if you raise your hand, you'll find lots of opportunities to engage. Okay, <clears throat> here's number two. I think that uh, the miracle of what's happened with GIS, Geographic Information Systems, over the last 20 years has been really just shocking. Just to give you a sense of it, uh, 25 years ago, if I were a real estate broker in some marketplace and you were the real estate decision maker for some tenant, you would call me up and say, hey, Blaine, I'm coming to town on Tuesday. Let's get in the car. We'll do a windshield tour. 
and that's the way we did it. We drove around and we drove through neighborhoods and, and you would say, well, you know, there's a lot of traffic on this street or, wow, these houses are really nicely taken care of. These people can probably afford our product or, wow, look at that high school. You know, it's really well taken care of, which means the people care, which means there's intact families. This is our marketplace. Well, in today's world, it's not so much about what you can see as what you can't see. And what I mean by that is instead of driving you up and down the street, I could show you a map that shows exactly what these people are spending money on. I could show you the credit card data. I could show you um, uh, cell phone tracking that shows not only where they go, but how long they stay and how many times they come to that location over the course of a week. So I could say things to you now like, you know, you should consider leasing this space because there's 1,500 people on property every day between 10 and 2. If you have some concept that serves food over lunchtime, this is the place to be. And so you wouldn't really be able to gauge that um, by just simply looking. You would have all of this data that's available. One of the best um, mapping scenarios is the... Uh, controlled portal called site to do business stdb stdb.com <clears throat> that um, is a portal controlled by the CCIMs and I would strongly encourage you to uh, flip through peruse the case studies the suggested reports the videos the webinars that they have placed to um, in a in a um, in an academy that are available for you to look at um, but here's the, here's the kind of bottom line on this, which is that one of the things that your generation can bring to our industry is the ability to tell stories in very powerful visual ways. In other words, um, the ability to tell stories through maps and tables and charts is spectacular, and we've been a little slow to understand it. We're counting on you to bring those skills into the industry. And you could really distinguish yourself and really impress the people around you if you had those skills. One thing you might do is check out an organization called Buxton. Buxton does this as a profession. Uh, many, many retailers hire them and uh, they produce very, very interesting newsletters and case studies. So if you just go to buxton.com or if you were to find yourself um, at the ICSC show, they always have a big booth. Um, but if you wanted to start to get a sense of what's out there, what's going on, look at Buxton.com or look at Placer, which is a cell phone tracking company, <clears throat> and um, uh, see what's out there and see if you could advance your own skills in this regard. Uh, okay, let's keep moving. <clears throat> um, so, there is this what I'm about to say has been credited to several different people. Um, this is the way the statement reads the only sustainable competitive advantage is the ability to learn quickly. So, what that means is it's about horsepower. So, that if I were an employer today and I was thinking I would like to hire a smart young person, I would like to hire a young person. I would like to hire a person that's new to the industry, bring them in, mentor them, and grow them up to lead our company. If I could only choose one attribute, the attribute that I might choose would be horsepower. And what I mean by that is that things change so rapidly in today's world that the ability to recognize change and adapt to it quickly is the attribute that sets you apart. There is no better way to develop horsepower than to read feverishly. Um, so I think you should have a list for yourself. It's a great question to ask people as you wander around. You can ask me and say, Blaine, what book do you think I should read? Or Grayson or anybody, any speaker that you run into, any person that seems like they might have an idea, you can ask them for recommendations and then create a list for yourself and then make it your goal to read one book per month. Now, I know that you're going to find, find this hard to believe, but if Anyone is, if you're talking to someone that's 40 or 50 years old or 60, they're going to remember some books that were pretty famous in their day, books like Good to Great. You should probably think about reading Good to Great. You should probably think about reading um, In Search of Excellence. You should probably think about reading The Seven Habits of Highly Effective because these are big time, almost Bibles for uh, people that have been in the business for a while. So uh, get a list. Uh, create a list for yourself and uh, ask for recommendations. 
you know, a great interviewing technique can be to say at some point, hey, before we end this interview, I would love for you to take a look at the list, my reading list. These are the books on my list. The ones that have red check marks through them or next to them are the ones that I've already re read, and I'm looking for more. And was when that's a great way of demonstrating that you are either have or are developing horsepower, which can be the which can be the attribute that really sets you apart. Um, <clears throat> it's all about your ability to communicate. I was just in a conversation uh, earlier today, and a big client that I work with is going to uh, enlarge their property accounting uh, staff. And what they've discovered is that as they work on, as the property managers and the property accountants work together, it becomes imperative for the two of them to create accurate reports, but then crucially report those upward and enable stakeholders to understand what's happening at the property level. So that's a long way of saying, wow, Blaine, I love numbers, man. I, I study accounting because I don't really, I'm not really a people person. And it's like, sorry, bud, those days are gone now. You have to be able to communicate, even if you have a technical or a numerical or a quantitative role on your team. So um, here's some ways you can think about that. Number one, of course, you already know this, zero errors on your resume. Um, there are many people of my generation that will say, gosh, if they can't get that right, I just can't use them. So um, if you have to, go to Upwork and find and pay a proofreader. Um, if you don't feel that you can get it done in your own sphere, you have to get that done. Number two, what I would suggest to you is that with all these Zoom calls, you can have a conversation with yourself or with a friend and tape it and see if you are communicating clearly. Are you, what is the pace at which you speak? How many us do you build into the way that you communicate with people? Do you demonstrate some vocabulary? Do you demonstrate that you are thoughtful? <clears throat> so watch yourself a couple of times. It is uh, extremely powerful. And then finally, here's a crazy idea for you. Um, take an improv class. I've been saying that for years. I've done it myself. Um, what improv does is force you to let go of yourself. You get in a group of other people, and the next thing you're doing is uh, doing some crazy skit or talking jabberwocky and communicating with your eyes closed or only with your hands, and it builds confidence in your communication skills. Um, if you cannot take a class, then, then attend a show and watch these people operate. If you really uh, want to think about this, there is an organization called Speakeasy. Their headquarters is in Atlanta. They have, they have um, facilities around the country, and they are um, I went to them when I was about 30 years old, and their their mantra is to turn uh, is to turn managers into leaders. And what that means is is that they believe communication is that is that card that converts you, that transforms you, that that ticket that can that transforms you. It's it's expensive uh, and it's unbelievably awkward to learn how to be a better speaker. But when you come out, it's like a boot camp, and you're better. Um, so you, I, can't, I can't overestimate how important it is that you find a way to maximize your communication skills. Um, now, here's, a, here's one you probably hear a lot. Um, it would be, I, I would have, maybe I should have counted this in some way, pursue your real estate license. Well, some people say, I already have it. Some people say, no, I'm not going to be in sales. I don't really care about it. I don't really, it's not interesting to me. And I would simply say, got it. You, it's likely you won't need it, but things change. Um, all kinds of things are changing and, and the, what licensees may be allowed or not be allowed to do in the future could be interesting. Um, However, if you get your real estate license and it is needed for any reason, then it shows that you're committed. In effect, what you would be saying is, look, Mr. Employer, um, I'm going into the real estate business. I got my license. I'm going to go into the real estate business, frankly, whether you hire me or not. Now, of course, you wouldn't say it that way, but the alternative would be for them to say, mm, we need, really need this person in this role to have a license, and so now there's a dilemma. Do we tell you, go away until you get it and call us back, or we'll hire you on July 1st, 
subject to you getting the license or we'll hire you but now you're going to take two weeks off going to get your license it's a it's not the dilemma that employers want um, if you already have the license in this great isolation consider taking getting your broker's license um, um, i have my my told you that my son um, he's 29 now he got his salesman's license a few years ago in florida you have to renew that license two years later and once renewed then you can pursue the brokerage license and he's like but dad i don't really need it i'm like son you will never be um uh less busy than you are right now and he goes what are you talking about i'm working all night i'm working all day and i'm like uh-huh but you don't have kids yet <laughs> you don't have 47 clients calling you so find a way to get it done by the way, of course, you have to take the course online. You couldn't, you, right now, you couldn't gather together anyway, but as an example in Florida, the pass rate on the salesman's test is 44%. Do you know why it's 44%? Because there are many people who take the course only so that they can save the money on their own house. Those people many times are challenged with language and arithmetic. They're not native English speakers. They haven't dealt in financial matters before. I am not against them. I am not prejudiced against them. It's just you're not in the same league with them. And you would uh, be semi-suicidal by the end of that week. So take it online. You can compress the, the sections and move much more quickly. So that would be my suggestion to you, which is consider in some way advancing your real estate license. Okay, that's section one of what I wanted to talk about. I'm going to take just a moment uh, and take a breath. Uh, Grayson, anything that we should deal with at this moment? Uh, I just want to remind the students as far as real estate license, and Blaine, this is just for your knowledge as well. One of the benefits of being in our program is uh, after the students take the intro to real estate, you know, the principal's course, and one other real estate course, and everyone on this call has done both they are eligible they have six months to take the alabama real estate license exam so i would say there's probably i don't know 10 to 15 students that are on on right now who already have their license and most uh are headed that direction so 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 all those students who are listening i'm glad that blaine brought that up to reinforce the importance uh don't you don't lose that opportunity it's not forever it's basically six months so uh, and while you have quote downtime potentially in may or while you're trying to get that job go ahead and knock it out some states reciprocate and some states don't it makes no difference it shows that you have commitment to the industry yeah that's exactly right and i think the reciprocation issue is a very good one there are many states that reciprocate where you really only send in you know $25 and you're good to go. Florida is not particularly cooperative, but uh, many states are. And in your lifetime, there will be a national real estate brokerage license. Um, it's, it's happening. It's going to come because so many of these groups are going across state lines like crazy. And what they're going to figure out sooner or later, it's better to create a universal standard than different standards in every state. So, okay. I think we... Um, I think we covered that. Anything else, Grayson? No, sir. Okay. Okay. Several nuggets. Keep rolling. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to go to sort of question number two, uh, students, and that is how to add action steps to your dream of becoming a developer. Well, um, let me give you a let me give you a synonym for developer: project manager. Um, the easiest way I can describe being a developer is that it's a lot like being a quarterback. And I know you, uh, University Roll Tide. Alabama, I know you University of Alabama people know what a quarterback is. Uh, just check the Heisman roster. So, um, but here's, here's the deal with a quarterback. The quarterback steps up to the line and he knows exactly what the other 10 people on his team are going to do. He knows exactly in his, he can look at where they're standing and know exactly what every single one of them is going to do. Now he may carry the ball. He, in other words, that would be like you self providing a service. Like you start out as a real estate broker. And then when you develop your project, you handle the leasing, or maybe you come at it from a legal perspective, or maybe you come at it from a construction perspective, or maybe you come at it from an architectural perspective. So you could carry the ball yourself, but regardless, you have to know what everybody on the team does. You also have a very good idea of what the 
other team is going to do. And so you must, must, must think of yourself as a project manager, as a quarterback. So what do you have to do to be a good quarterback? Well, um, I want to push you toward the idea of thinking about the number one tool of all project managers. It's called a Gantt chart. I don't know what exposure you've had to it. You can learn more about Gantt charts on lynda.com or Khan Academy. You can go to the Microsoft Project. Microsoft Project is the name of their Gantt chart creating software. There's all kinds of videos. There's a kind of a rising star called Smartsheet. You can learn about what a Gantt chart is. But, but here's what's going to happen when you get into the construction, into the commercial real estate arena and you interact with someone who's in the construction world. And this is what every contractor always says. They always say we are always on time and on budget. So if you think about how that could possibly be true, obviously they are uh, giving you a budget that has, um, that has some fudge factor in it. I don't mean in any negative way. I just mean that they have budgeted contingency. They've budgeted that they can bring this thing in on budget. Now, the way that they say that they can get it on, on time is they say, here is the Gantt chart. They show you the Gantt chart, which is a series of uh, steps. Some are sequential, which means one happens and then the next one happens. Some are, some are simultaneous or concurrent. But what it helps them do is show this is the um, critical path. And they can say things like, if you ever walk into a construction trailer, you'll hear someone about your age saying, look, Jerry, if you don't get those porta potties here on Tuesday, I'm going to come find you and choke you. And the reason I need those porta potties here on Tuesday is because I'm pouring the slab on Wednesday. And if I don't pour the slab on Wednesday, my project is not going to finish on time. And Jerry, you know, the porta potty guy is like, I don't really see what you're so upset about. The project doesn't deliver for another eight months. He's like, yeah, and I have 247 steps between now and then. So one of the things that you can do to become a much more powerful, much more effective developer is learn how to read, create and read Gantt charts early on. If you want to be powerful, you want to be able to go toe to toe with your architect, your engineer and your contractor and say, great, let's pull out the Gantt chart and let's sift it together. Um, okay, number two, if you are the quarterback, now maybe you're not going to be the quarterback at age 22, but what if we said, so we're going to give you 10 years to become a uh, quarterback, and so at age 32, you get to, the good news is you get to become a quarterback, uh, but here's the deal. You get to pick all the players. You get to pick the left tackle and the right guard, the center, the tailback, the tight end, the, the wide receiver, the flanker. You get to pick all those guys. And so that's one of the reasons why I don't recommend that you do become a developer at 22 because you haven't had enough time to see all these people play. And so one of the things that I want you to think about is uh, you get to pick your all-star team. You get to decide who those people are going to be. So here's my suggestion to you, which is you know you're going to need an architect. You know you're going to need a civil engineer. You know you're going to need a designer. You know you're going to need a contractor. You're going to need a lawyer. You're going to need a marketing plan. And so what have you done in, say, 2020 to uh, go visit five different architects? Go, and I don't mean go visit, like go see them in their office and, hey, have Starbucks down the street. What I mean is go to one of their projects and say, well, so tell me some of the challenges you faced here. What, what on this project are you most proud of? In what way did you save the owner money? If you had to do it over again, what would you change? And imagine having that discussion with five different architects. Um, many times they are eager to talk about it. Many times they're like, what do you think? They want to get your perspective on it. So what that does is it gives you the ability to go like, wow, these guys are on it. These guys are going to be on my all-star team. And you, and you keep track of them. But here's the, real, um, here's the real heart of it, gang. If you're going to be a developer, you are going to sign personally. Now, signing personally works something like this. The project is $10 million. Somehow you uh, aggregate $3 million in equity and you borrow $7 million. Now, you may be able to shield the other equity players from also having to sign personally, but the bank is going to say, hmm, somebody at this table is going to sign personally, and they're all going to look at you. And what that means is that if the project ever got in trouble and was sold for less than the amount of the debt, let's say that it, uh, there was a uh, let's say that you had just delivered your shopping center and now nobody pays rent, and the lender takes it back and goes, man, the most we can sell this thing for is $5 million. 
and then the lender goes, great, we're going to short sell it. We're going to take the $5 million to recover some of our collateral. Then they're going to turn and look at you, and they're going to say, uh, you owe us $2 million. Uh, you got to make us whole. And you do not want to fight that battle without outstanding teammates around you. You don't want you don't want things to go wrong. You don't want to, to not be well protected. You don't want to be poorly designed or poorly constructed or deliver it late. It's, it's, it's a challenge. It's like trying to win the SEC championship every single time you run on the field. It is going to be a tough game, and you need the best players around you, and that's your job over the next 10 years. Okay, <clears throat> another um, idea for you is that um, the way that a development project uh, gets off to a successful start is that there is a successful due diligence period. So a common way that it works is the project, the property goes under contract. I decide that I'm going to buy the property for $10 million and I put up $100,000 and I have 45 days to evaluate the property and at the end of 45 days I fish or cut bait. I can get my $100,000 back for any reason whatsoever. Sorry, I don't like it. I'm, I'm taking my money back, seller goes, great. Now, it looks like I just got my $100,000 back, but I will have probably spent $50,000 in studies, et cetera, to decide whether I do or I don't like it. So you want to be well oiled by the time your 45-day clock starts. Once again, you gotta run the right people on the field at the right time. You don't want to sign a contract that gives you 45 days and then go, hey, Blaine, do you know any good site inspectors? then I would just say, dude, just call them up and get your money back right now before you completely fall on your face. So, so you've got to make that due diligence process work right. And so one of the things that I would offer to you is that if you see one go by, uh, you should grab it and make a copy of it. You could search for them. If you go to Amazon and type commercial real estate due diligence checklist, five or six books will pop up. If you go to your favorite restaurant uh, that is a, fr a franchise restaurant and expanding, then you, many times they have their real estate criteria right there and there'll be sometimes only 10 issues. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll give you a four page checklist and say, if you would like to submit your site to Dickie's Barbecue, please fill out the attached form. And you're like, what? And you look at it and it's like, I can't believe they're asking all these questions. Like what is the height of the curb? Really? Uh-huh. Then what you have to do is make sure that you begin to understand them. You're going to find them filled with acronyms. You're going to find them filled with words that you don't understand. And what you're going to want to start thinking about is what does that mean and what are the similarities? Sometimes the same thing is called something different in a different market. In some markets, um, there is a zoning of PUD, planned unit development, and some um, markets they call that PD or they call that variance special variance district. And so you have to learn how to understand what these items are. Ultimately, remember that you will integrate them into your Gantt chart. What due diligence items can you launch simultaneously and which ones have to be sequential? And if you can become an expert at that, you will be a more powerful developer. Okay. Um, once again, Grayson, let me take a breath. Anything pop up that we want to talk about before I move into the third and final piece? Let's see here. We have we can attack one question real quick. I think it'd be great time to do that. Uh, Sam uh, asked, "How do you feel about getting cert certifications like Argus or other modeling courses?" Well, um, when I would teach at the University of North Carolina, uh, I taught there for four years at Chapel Hill, and they had a Argus. They had an arrangement with Argus where they had a boot camp, and so you'd go in on Friday and you come out Sunday. And then when I would teach on Monday, some students would come up to me and go, I did it. I got my Argus certification. And I'm okay with it. Um, what I mean by that is I think what it demonstrates is that you, that's another way of demonstrating that you have horsepower. Um, there are some people that use Argus as a modeling um, tool. Um, and in some cases, that's exactly what you'll be doing. If you go to work for any of the capital markets type flavored type people, then there will be discussion about your Excel skills and your analytical skills. Um, I would say that, um, you know, not everybody uses Argus, which is sort of a complex overlay of Excel. In general, I think you should have above average Excel skills. When I work with the people that I work with, and they're going to bring a new teammate on, what we do is we have moved from saying, listen, Excel and accuracy are very important. Tell me about your Excel skills. 
We don't do that anymore. What we do is we say, look, here's a laptop with an Excel spreadsheet. I want you to make these three changes. First, I want you to find the three errors, and then I want you to make these three changes in the assumptions and come out with a new number in, in cell X42. So I think if you knew you were going to go into a skills test um, as an employee, a potential employee, how would you govern yourself now? So I'm not against Argus. I'm in favor of it. I think it primarily shows horsepower, but I would tell you that Excel, the ability to manipulate Excel is, in my mind, more important than Argus by itself. I have just a question. I'll maybe I just want you to reinforce. These students may it may be a little, it, may, it may take two, I mean sixty days, nine days to get that job that may have been thirty days, three or four months ago. But during this little window of I, I call it a window of opportunity actually, uh, Alabama of course, but other states have very robust CCIM chapters, which leads to education, the four courses. Would you recommend? if they had the opportunity to go ahead and use that for the knowledge, but also the networking. So, I mean, talk about if the students should maybe think about CI 101 uh, here in the next 60, 90 days. Well, what are your thoughts? Well, I think um, be, although we're isolated, which means it will be harder for you to take a classroom course, which is where the networking is really hyper-accelerated, although you may be able to get into one, two, three months out. I don't know for sure. But let me put it to you this way. Um, I sat where you sat. I got an undergraduate and graduate degree in real estate. Uh, I got that uh, graduate degree in 1980. Within about three years, I was first introduced to the CCIM program. So in 1983, I took CI 101. You know what happened? I got 100 on the test. You could make the case I didn't learn anything. But that's not true. What happened was it launched me into my CCIM career, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is unbelievable. And you know why it was unbelievable? Because the information was taught by street players. It wasn't taught by professors. Professors Now, some professors in today's world have had street expo exposure, but when you learn the investment techniques and the, the investment analysis, but then you learn how to talk about it and convey it and tell compelling stories, which is what street people do that professors do not do, it's extremely powerful. So, you know, I'm a huge fan, but... You have to remember, my dad's a CCIM, and my son is a CCIM, and I'm a CCIM, so I drank the Kool-Aid. Uh, I'm right through with you. Crimson Kool-Aid. All right. Okay. Other questions or move on? You can move on. Okay. So, gang, I'm now on my third piece here, uh, which is where the CARE brokerage industry is headed. Um, you know, you might look at this, uh, what I'm about to say, and go, well, that doesn't sound very exciting. That doesn't sound very interesting. Um, NAR, National Association of Realtors, SIOR, which is a designation, uh, CCIM, have all done surveys. And what these surveys show is that the average age of a commercial real estate broker in the United States is 60 years old. And it's a lot of old white guys. Now, I can say that just because I'm an old white guy. Now, I'm not trying to be racial or prejudiced or anything else. It's just that that's where we are today. It's a large group of people that look like me. So what happens when you're 60 years old is that you are less interested in building a team and building uh, and going to meetings. You're more interested in serving the clients you have and maybe making one or two investments that or 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 enlarging or even selling your investments that you've accumulated through the years because you're thinking you're maybe closer to the end. That's compounded by what I would call limited intake programs. The, the, um, this is described and adapted at length, but unfortunately, if you try to get a job at CBRE or JLL or Cushman and Wakefield, the three biggest brokers, it, you may or may not be um, associated with any kind of orientation program or wheel program. It's pretty limited. It's possible that you will find an opportunity right where you are, in the town or city where you are, where there is a mentor uh, who wants to help you, build you, pass on to you. And that's what I would call sort of a legacy opportunity. And if you get that, um, the, what I would be thinking about is how do you see my evolution over time? In other words, am I just a task rabbit for you? Or am I helping you build something? And what is my evolution going to look like? Sometimes you can ask, what has happened to the people that have been in this role before me? You'll, it will maybe look like an opportunity to be mentored, but what you find out is five out of the five of the last people have lasted a year and then moved on. 
you still might take the job because it might be the kind of exposure to be valuable to you. You just have to understand that up front. You will also find in some of these markets there are gaping holes that people have begun to retire and no one was uh, slotted for their niche. And so as a result, there can be some gaping, gaping holes. Um, there are also changes. In other words, you'll find that more and more, as an example, the retail players, the retailers of the world are, the decision makers are very, very young. And so you can move into a world like that maybe very quickly, uh, as opposed to if you are going to try to trade multifamily properties, you're going to find they're all old guys like me. So they're like, Sonny, ah, eh, I can't hire you. You haven't even, you know, you're still in diapers. And it's going to be like, yeah, it's going to be tougher because they're tougher and older. So what you have to do is just evaluate sort of what you see in front of you. It's a very mixed picture right now in terms of coming into the brokerage arena. <clears throat> now, maybe the good news. Transparency is coming. Um, there are many people who have said that because of the nature of the demographic that has been dominant through the years in, and that we've been relatively slow to change, partly because we haven't had to, we're like, uh, yeah, um, sure. But, you know, I have one client who still um, doesn't know how to retrieve voicemail off of his phone. And when someone calls the office, uh, he has someone write down the message and then hand him the message. So um, those days are almost over. When you think about what's called transparency, which is the ability of the client to see into the arena and have control of that information, um, that's transparency. Now, none of you are old enough to remember what it was like to travel before 9-11. But once upon a time, uh, if you wanted to go someplace, you called a travel agent, you talked on the phone, the phone that had a rotary dial and a cord, and you said what you wanted to do, and they said, let me work on it, and they would call you back, and you say, you have these three options, and they would say, you would say what you wanted, and then about two days later, a courier would bring over a paper ticket to you, and, and then there were no set times, you just had to get there before they took off, and um, by the way, you could smoke, so um, what happened, of course, is if you had to deal with a travel agent now, you'd be like, this is an incredible hassle. I can see all the airlines at once. I have services that pick out my best fares. And so you have access, you have a view into and the ability to manipulate the information that you need. Well, that is happening in commercial real estate. There is more and more access to information, whether it's subscription or whether it's public information, um, than ever before. And as a result, the scope of services for commercial real estate brokers is changing. You could say, oh yeah, but we add context. <clears throat> we have wisdom. And I would say, yeah, you ought to take a look at what's happened to online legal, which is some companies that you will go to work for will have a benefit plan, which allows you to take $12 a month and have it subtracted from your paycheck. And it goes to your benefit plan. And one of your benefits is online legal capability or uh, legal services. And so what happens is that uh, people now are writing their own wills, they're writing their own contracts, and all these lawyers that said, no, 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 it can't be done that way. Um, it's like, well, yeah, it can. There are now templates <clears throat> and helpers and chat boxes and YouTube videos that enable people to do this. And so last year, there were about $5 billion in fees paid to online uh, legal services. So just to give you a sense of it, that all that money that was spent paying lawyers and waiting for a human to do the work have been shifted into a new arena. Perhaps the most exciting thing that's happening in terms of transparency is that the really smart people are mining the data. Think of it this way. If I said to you, hey, could you predict in your market the next 50 multifamily properties to sell? What if I gave you that assignment? Could you figure that out? And you'd say, well, gosh, I don't know, how would I do that? And it wouldn't take long until you said, well, why don't we look at the last 300 sales? Why don't we look at 20 data points on those last 300 sales? Why don't we use multiple regression, create an algorithm that becomes predictive? And pretty soon you hand me a list and says, here's the 50 properties they're going to sell next. And I said, really, how did you come to this decision? You go, well, it turns out, Blaine, that the properties that have been held by the same entity seven years or longer that have recently had a capital improvement, that are located in white collar areas, and that have more than 200 units sell more frequently. And so this is the list of properties that's gonna sell 
soonest. And so in the new world order, what's happening is this predictive ability is coming to the real estate world. The brokers know it, but so do the owners. And so it's going to be a very interesting uh, rejiggering of what the value uh, proposition that brokers offer. 15 years ago, you had to call a broker because they had the information and there was really no other way to get it. And their long history driving up and, same down, up and down the same streets was unmatched. But in today's world, there's so much information available and information that hasn't even been fully grasped like these algorithms that is coming to bear very, very rapidly. So if, you, if that was interesting to you, then it could be that you would be in that world. That's what I, in my book, I say, you know, would a young person become a broker or just build the app? So um, to that end, um, you may be familiar with what Colliers has done in terms of uh, they have uh, sponsored uh, Techstars, which is a uh, startup lab, and they have created one just for commercial real estate. And they had 800 young people apply to their program, and there's a winnowing process. Here's my idea. Here's where I why I think it's needed. And they um, they if you get accepted, then they put you with a mentor, and you begin to develop um, these. Um, applications that are needed in the industry. So the big companies now, JLL, Cushman, CB, just, just Google has CBRE invested in Optech or PropTech or sometimes just CRE tech. And you'll learn about fifth wall and, and you'll learn about the amount of money that they're spending trying to uh, integrate technology into the world of commercial real estate. Optech means uh, for the, on the operation side, can we learn more about our organization? Can we code data in certain ways and learn things? Prop tech tends to be, can we make the buildings operate more efficiently? Um, you're already familiar that with smart systems as an example that allow you to <coughs> monitor the energy usage as an example. Um, but that's a, that's a shallow example of the kinds of things that are being done in the prop tech world. But here's what will happen. If you go to the CRE tech type conferences that I've gone to, you're gonna hear these people say, look, We've put a lot of money into this, and we will build the applications if we have to, but we much prefer to come to big conferences like this, stand out in the, in the foyer at the booths and tell you what we need, and then have you bring it to us so we can buy it off the shelf. We'd much rather have you flop around with it and then prove to us that it works, and we'll buy it. That discussion was unheard of five years ago, and it is the cutting edge of where we're at now. So some of you may find that your avenue into the commercial real estate world may be looking at it with a whole new set of lenses, which is not can I get in the business and, and be the business, can I be the principal, but can I be the coordinator, can I be the controller of the information? Because in the end, the ability to to build and sell an information company sells at an even better rate than the real estate itself. So that's an idea for you in terms of opportunities that we couldn't even think about. You know, we, we, when I got out of college, we were so excited to have a fax machine. We all gathered around it and watched the pages come out of it. It's a little different world now. Okay, so I covered my, I think I covered my territory there, Grayson. Um, what can we address now? We're going to do a little Q&A. I do okay. want to say, I want to, just while it's fresh in my mind, uh, I want to, to piggyback on your comments on, I went to my first prop tech conference last year in Nashville. Uh, it was just, and it, you know, consistent to your comments. It was very, very eye opening and very exciting. And so uh, definitely students keep an eye uh, on those developments, that area. So we have three questions. I'm sure we'll have more. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we can go top to bottom. John Price uh, asked this question, and this is the first one. Is there any benefit in getting your broker's license when you hold an executive position with another company? You know, I believe there is a clause saying you cannot hold or maintain an active license concurrently. 
Well, I presume every state's a little bit different. In Florida, you earn the license and then you put it on inactive status. All that means is, is you're not using it in your everyday world. As long as you keep up with your CE credits, it's, <clears throat> it remains viable but inactive. But if you want to make it active tomorrow, you go on the website and click the on button and it's active. You're in, you're in the game. So I just want to make sure, John, that uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I just want to say in Florida, the way that works is that you can get it and put it in inactive status. The other thing that most people do is they say, look, I got my, I got my license and I'm going to put it with some agency and just let it sit there. And they'll say, great, you have to pay us $50 a year for administrative costs. And you're like, I'm never going to do a deal. And they're like, fine, fine, fine. And then it doesn't harm your employment status. If you then decide, hey, I'm going to buy a house and could I use it for that? Sure, it, just, it requires a conversation and your existing company may want to know about that or be aware of it, but it's not normally pro problematic. And I just want to mention as, you know, you can still get the license and again, it really the default position is inactive. So you can literally get your license, it's on your resume, and it may stay inactive for five years, three years, 10 years. I got my license like Blaine did when I was a university student here in Alabama. I got my sales license in 88, my broker's license back then. You could get that upon graduation, got that in 89. I've always, I've told you class, I've always thought about those licenses as kind of uh, employment insurance or unemployment insurance. I mean, if all hell broke loose, I always had a license that I could flip on, flip the switch. And, and, and get out there and do what I do what you got to do. Uh, and in that 30 year frame, there's been times where it's been an, uh, inactive and active. The next question is from Dan. What initial position role do you feel is the most effective for someone who wants to transition into development? Well, I guess my reaction to that is Dan, um, remember, when you're 32 years old and you're the all-star quarterback and you've picked your all-star team, you, you have to be excellent in all of those disciplines. So in other words, you have to, you, you may say, I'm, I don't have any interest in being a civil engineer. That's okay. But you still have to pick the best civil engineer. Um, there's, I wouldn't say there's any particular role that um, assures you of success as a developer or to say it differently, lawyers, contractors, architects, brokers, designers have all made successful switches, transformations into becoming a developer. So what I would just tell you is, is that sure, you may find that whatever you're doing causes you to be able to self provide that service. In other words, when I became a developer, I absolutely took control of the marketing. I knew I am a marketer. I'm a real estate marketer by background. And so I hired my own staff. I created my own property management company because I knew how the real estate operates, but I had to hire contractors and architects and engineers, et cetera. Um, one thing that I would tell you that you can do um, that I think will help you, which is uh, if you want to have some fun, wander down to the public hearings when development projects are uh, considered by the municipal boards, whether you live in a burg, a village, a town, a city, a state, um, listen to those discussions because what happens is a lot of different people check in with their perspectives. And that would be one of the best things you could do regardless of what angle you come at, come at the, uh, at the, at the uh, role of being a developer. Now, this is from Sam. What other skills or books do you wish you had worked on or read at 20, when you were 22 to, uh, of course, it says to become a better developer, but I would just say just to be a, a better, let's just keep it broader than that, just say real estate professional. Well, um, so many people ask me that question that when I wrote the first book, Thrive, in in Thrive, there is a reading list. So many people ask me that question. Um, and it kind of depends on what's of most interest to you. But I guess if I had to pick one book, um, I would tell you that in my opinion, what happens when you hang out in a university environment is that you become, you become um, smart, you become knowledgeable, but not really wise because you cannot become wise until you gulp down large swallows of experience. 
And so when I taught at the University of North Carolina, I've taught at four different universities, but when I taught at the University of North Carolina, I became, and I taught real estate 101 to juniors and seniors, I became persuaded that they must read a book called The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb. The reason that I feel so strongly about that book is because Taleb uh, addresses risk. And what we underestimate is, um, the, uh, is not knowing what we don't know, and we undervalue the risk. So um, what happens is you work on a project, and the instructor says to you, okay, I want you to create a, a viability analysis or you know, some kind of uh, spectrum of will this thing work, and then they say, so you know, let's have a, a least likely, a sort of likely, and a most likely, or a best and worst case, or things like that. And what happens is that um, the black swans, which are high impact but unforeseen events, are never adequately considered. So I, it's, it's not an easy book to read um, because T Taleb is extremely smart, but I urge you to um, learn much more about risk. And I don't mean, you know, the beta of stocks, positive or negative against the marketplace. I'm talking about real risk. Um, he gives many, many examples in there that will cause you to think about risk in a new way. And I think for a young person in particular to be cogent, to be cognitive of that risk and begin to integrate it into your thinking at a younger age will be very valuable. Most of us who got in trouble uh, signed, too, signed personally too often or made too big a bet, it was because we didn't fully reckon with the risk. And uh, we always talk about risk reward, risk management. So thank you for sharing that. That, that. that is very consistent with a lot of thoughts that we've talked about in my class, which is basically also property management. Uh, Jake has a question. It's basically as a college, a, a new graduate in the brokerage industry, industry where, you know, he anticipates the commissions to take some time. So basically low, uh, can you hold your license with a residential broker also and use that to supplement your wages. Well, that that I don't want to be. I don't want to wander into areas that I'm not um, legitimate. I mean, I don't know what any given state would would say. But if you're asking me, are there people who are real estate brokers by day and bartenders at night? Yeah, <laughs> that's what a lot of us did. You know, was try to find some way to make money, kind of in the in the meantime. My son, for the first two years of his commercial real estate career parked cars on the weekend. And so I don't know exactly if that's what you're talking about, where there's, you know, can I be employed and still be a, a, uh, a licensed agent? The woman who's cut my hair for the last 20 years has been cutting my hair for 20 years. And mostly what I do when I sit in the chair is listen to her talk about a residential real estate brokerage career. So um, yeah, I think particularly in the beginning, you do what you have to do. Now, when I was at CBRE, what we did is we said, look, we're going to pay you draw and we're going to pay you $3,000 a month and we want you to earn commissions to make that back. Because we're paying you $3,000 a month, we forbid you to get any other job, which was code for if you have energy to go be a bartender for four hours a night, given that we're already paying you draw and draw is simply prepaid commission, then you have the energy to drive the market one more time. You have the you have the energy to read another book. You have the energy to become better at some system. And so, you know, that could come into play too. Great, great, great. This is from Jake. My dad owns a commercial real estate group in Cleveland, Ohio. He told me recently that retail is taking a huge hit to the, to the quarantines. Do you think there is going to be a commercial real estate boom regarding acquiring tenants after quarantines in states are over? Well, um, I would say that the common the common uh, philosophy these days is that uh, the single the single worst real estate to own right now would be hotels, followed by retail. Mm -hmm. That hospitality is going to have a just a long brutal climb out. And of course, remember they don't have any tenants; they just have people like you and me that are going. Well, I don't know. Am I willing to go? You know, be compressed into a hotel environment. Um, you know, I live about eight miles from Disney World. How would you like to own Disney World? Under what conditions would you be willing to reopen Disney World? So 
you know, there's definitely some challenges here. Um, in the retail world, there are already many, many articles that are talking about um, landlords who are saying, look, I'm not going to give you any free rent or forgive you any rent until we sit down together and look at what you can really pay. So if you're just telling me, oh, we have no customers and we can't pay, then I would say, well, I probably shouldn't have done business with you in the first place if you don't have any margin whatsoever. If you want me to help you, then you have to help me understand. And maybe we can come up with some kind of scenario. Maybe we can extend the term later into the years and you can pay me on the backside somehow. Um, there are always situations in these kind of downturns where people say, well, um, I'll remember how you treated me. And, and both landlords and tenants, that plays both ways. So, um, yeah, I think if your family owns retail properties or involved in retail properties, it's going to be a tough one. Um, I would tell you that in the state of Florida, we are consistently over retailed. I'm telling you, if there's just one single sparkle of demand up, oh, we need three restaurants to fill that. You know, I live in, I live in a place where there are five major grocery stores within two and a half miles of me. Now, I only shop at one. Do I really need a Whole Foods and three Publixes and a Fresh Market all right on top of me? I mean, I can't shop that much. And so um, I think in some ways this will cause a, probably a needed adjustment to where we get back to a little bit more balance. All right. We'll, we'll close with this one with Cody. And I have just one semi-question to close with. But Cody. Uh, he has a he's an accounting major with a real estate focus. We all know that real estate is limited, as are all resources. Is there a fear that the number of people in the game will outnumber the need for people? In other words, are we close to the peak of people in relationship or in relation to jobs in real estate? Well, that's a that's a great question and probably would be worth uh, almost like a day long symposium, but let me give you a couple things. Uh, let, let me give you a couple things to think about, uh, Cody. So, um, uh, you know, population growth in the United States is um, really only fueled by immigration. Now, the the birth replacement rate in the United States is very very close to zero. It's below zero in Europe, and so the reason that there's so much immigration in Europe is that. There aren't, they're not replacing themselves quick enough. And so to get certain kinds of things done and certain services provided, they have to continue to, to immigrate, to, to allow immigration. And of course, you know, you know, who knows what the immigration situation is in the United States. It's been a very, uh, it's been a, a strange and wonderful journey, I guess, uh, in the current environment. So the first question that you might think about is what is population growth in general? And if there were consistent population growth, where will we put those people? That would be kind of maybe part A. Part B would be to say, um, is real estate, are there some forms of real estate that are becoming obsolete? And so the fact that it's already developed, does, does that mean that that's the way it stands or will there be redevelopment? And you, know, you guys are gonna do a lot more work on redevelopment than we did. In Florida, it's called greenfield development, where you go out to the next interstate interchange and you buy all the land and you build stuff. But Florida is a giant swamp and we are running out of what's called upland. There's not as much land to develop anymore, so we must look back on the things that have already been developed and decide, is this really the highest and best use? Well, in a lot of places, we've decided that um, that we can just ram, you can, we, can just, we can just run. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, potentially available land in Alabama as an example. But here's a couple ideas for you. <clears throat> you might be interested in a book called The Triumph of the City by Professor Ed Glazer at Harvard. And the subtitle of that book is something like this, Why the City is Man's Greatest Invention. Why Cities Are Greener, Smarter, uh, younger and more energetic. And it's a real tribute. And I think he brings out a lot of good points where we're going to live in these major cities where there's going to be continued urbanization of our population. The second book you might be interested in is a book called When the Boomers Bail, um, which was written about 15 years ago. And what it talks about is what happens when the baby boom, which was previously the largest sector, um, moves out of the workforce. It's still around, but moves out of the workforce. So as an example, um, what happens to guys like me that live much, much longer than we ever thought we were gonna live? Only 3% of old people, I'll put myself in that group, live in senior housing. But will we move more and more to that? Um, 
how will that work? Or will I expect because you're my son to come move in with you in your groovy new cool uh, apartment in downtown Charlotte with the rooftop pool? You see me moving in with you? Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, reuse, what they call adaptive reuse, that is going to ensure that we will not run out of smart people, the need for smart people in our world. Uh, fantastic uh, answer. And I'll, I want to close with this, just, I guess, maybe a, hopefully you can reconfirm it. A lot of the students in this call were in my, are in my current real estate management course, Blaine, and just your kind of, t I mean, just your thoughts overall of real estate management, maybe as a career, or just the importance of real estate management in the big picture of this fascinating industry called real estate. By real estate management, do you mean property management? Is that yes. what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Well, um, if this needs it at full day symposium too, and I would personally fund this. Um, I make a living helping people figure out the property management question. And here's what I mean by that. Um, so the top professor at the University of Florida is David Ling. Uh, his counterpart, Wayne Archer, wrote a book. McGraw-Hill has got it in its maybe, I don't know, eighth or ninth printing. And it's a book that a lot of real estate, a lot of real estate uh, programs use this book. So go to that book and turn to the chapter on property management. And what you'll see is that they are believers in what I would call a strong property manager, sort of like a strong mayor. And what happens is accounting and leasing and construction all report to property management. In other words, they are the day-to-day -day owner of the property. If I own the property and you were my manager, I would say, uh, Grayson, I expect you to develop a budget and then I will approve that budget. I'll work with you to make sure that we both are happy with it. I'll approve it. And then frankly, I expect you to deliver that budget. And so in order for you to answer questions like, the likelihood that this tenant will renew. And when they renew, at what rate will they renew? And if that space is vacant, how long will it be vacant? And then how much money will we have to put in an improvement? And what commission will we have to pay? And how long will the term be? Well, that means that the property manager is taking that in from its field agents, its leasing agents, or its third-party brokerage firms. All of that has to be managed by the day-to-day -day owner, the property management, the property manager. Now, here's, here's the problem. Um, in Florida, that has somehow devolved into a um, sort of a loss leader. And a lot of people came into Florida and said, look, we'll manage your building for $500 a month, comma, as long as we get the brokerage rights to it so that we make money from the leasing. And if it sells, we handle that sale for you as well. So as a result, the property management um, the people that are in property management have tended to be lesser qualified because the firms that are taking $500 a month in cannot properly pay those people. If you go to the CBREs and the JLLs and the Cushmans of the world, what you'll discover is there's some very senior, very well qualified property managers, but for the most part, they are woefully, woefully oversourced. In other words, they, they, are, they have 100 people that report to them who each manage 10 properties. And so, um, Again, I think they've sort of compromised property management. But let me put it to you this way. When you own your own property, you cannot, you cannot afford to undermanage your property. You must, must, must be a powerful, strong property manager owner. Uh, and you will never care more about property management than when you own a building. If you own a building and then you go back into the services business, which is effectively what I did, you will become a disciple of the strong property manager mentality because you look at it as an owner. No owner's gonna say, no, 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 let's skim on that management. Let's let, the, let's let the property look like crap. Nobody really cares about that. Let's not have any compliance. Let's not have good files. No owner says that, um, or they only say it once. And so I think there's tremendous opportunity there. Um, there's a lot of technology coming into property management. I would say that if you had an opportunity to be exposed to MRI or Yardi, just sort of what they're doing and what they're thinking about these days, I think that would be great insight for you. Rem remember, if you're going to become a developer, you're on your path to becoming an owner, and you're going to care deeply about property management at that point. So that would be another part of your all-star team that you're going to have to figure out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Blaine, I see your screen. Go ahead and say a few more things about the Thrive and Adapt. And also, well, I, I have a feeling I've never seen so many people stay on the line this long. So we have 65 of <laughs> Seven is phenomenal. So they have taken it in and go ahead and mention 
and I'll find that link to send to them. But go ahead and also re mention about you and Jeff upcoming. Cause I have a feeling so many students are wanna are gonna want to gravitate to learn more about the book Adapt at that time. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let me uh, do this real quick. What I'm gonna do is um, change what's on my screen if I could. Um, here is um, is the is the real next is that what you can see on the screen right now, uh, Grayson? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is, RealNex is a giant CRM, contact relationship manager. Many, many brokers use RealNex to keep track of their prospects, their clients, and the properties. Uh, this guy, Jeff Finn, is the CEO. He'll be interviewing me on Thursday, this coming Thursday at four o'clock uh, Eastern time, and um, I will be um, giving a sampler of what is inside this book called Adapt. And so, <clears throat> um, Here's the here's the statement. This book should be read and absorbed by anyone who plays in or touches the CRE arena, since it considers the impact of nine forces that are already moving to radically change our world. The brokerage business has been largely conducted in the same way since I entered it 40 years ago, but now disruption is at hand. I'll share what I see happening and offer ways that you can prepare. By the way, chapter nine, the crowning chapter is about you, the young people. Here come the young people. And so, you know, I think you'll be interested in it. All uh, right. So uh, we gotta, what we'll do is we will forward this to you because what you wanna get to is that button right there. Yes, By sir. the way, remember, even if you're taking a test, you can register and then you'll get the follow-up email with the archive. Okay, so, um, you know, I didn't come to sell books, gang, but um, there are two books that I've written. They're both bestsellers. You can find them on Amazon. You can see they're sort of sister books. Thrive was written uh, two years ago, and Thrive has a subtitle, 10 Prescriptions for Exceptional Performance as a Commercial Real Estate Agent. So it is written to producing agents that will begin to run into uh, various challenges. And so that book contains my remedies, my prescriptions for the challenges that producing agents will uh, come into, and if they can institute the remedies or solve the problems, then they remove an obstacle and they begin to accelerate. So Thrive is how to do better now. Adapt says disruption is coming. Are you ready? And so it talks about here's where I think we're going over the next 10 years. So as you can see, they're, you know, they're sister books um, in the sense that one is about now and the next book is about what's about to happen. You can buy them in hardcover. You can buy them in Kindle, audiobook. Uh, you can buy them at Amazon. You can also buy them on my website. If you use that ADAPT 2020 promo code, you get 20% off the hardcover, but only off the hardcover. The Kindle is $9.99. The audiobook's about 6 bucks. Blaine, on behalf of the University of Alabama and uh, the Alabama Center for Real Estate, this is kind of brought to the students by our initiative called CCAP, which is the Collegiate Career Assistance Program. We deeply, deeply appreciate your time uh, tonight. What a phenomenal hour plus. Uh, those who've come behind you in this series of talking to the industry influencers like yourself, they've got a hard act to follow, I can assure you. Very well done. Thank you so much. God bless you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. By the way, which of the C, uh, the CCIM classes do you teach? So these students will be they start thinking about that. Where can they find you? What number do you teach right now? No, well, I, all there's about 60 instructors on the planet. All of us teach two courses. I only two courses. We're considered to only be able to be uh, subject matter experts in two courses. So I teach 101, the, the entry course. Once you take 101, you can take all the other classes in any order that you want. 101 is the keystone, and then I teach 103, which is user real estate, sale versus lease, sale lease back, etc. And uh, you know, love to love to see uh, love to see the students in some way. And and when I do see you, please come back and or come up to me and remind me that we were together on this night. Sounds great because these students literally come from all over the country. Blaine, out of 105 students in my particular class, at least 65 percent are out of state students, and you would not believe the roster of where they come from. So there is a chance you may see them out and about. There's no doubt in my mind. Blaine, well, thank you again. Go ahead, go ahead Blaine. I was just going to say, well, at your recommendation, I scrolled through the student profiles, the student profiles. So I saw the kind of students that you have and what they're learning, and I looked at several LinkedIn profiles and things like that. So uh, I agree with you. You got you got a group of all stars here, and I think the purpose of tonight is to hopefully try to give you an ability to accelerate so that you can assume the position that you should be in in our industry. 
that's the perfect way to, to end it. Thank you again, Blaine. God bless. We will we'll talk soon. And thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you again.